Hey, welcome. I'd like to welcome all of you to the PhD dissertation defense of Jay Silver. For those who don't know me, I'm Mitch Resnick. I'm you know, Jay's advisor here at the Media Lab. We also have the committee members for the dissertation, Neary Oxman and Bob McCock. We appreciate their serving on the committee. Um, and you know, started earlier today, there was a bit of confusion because I was in Linda Peterson's office. Uh, and she's the administrator for the academic program here at the Media Lab. And she told me she just got a phone call from the MIT registrar who said they've received the, uh, the information from Jay about submitting his dissertation. But they said it came in with a co-author listed, which is a little unusual, and a co-author of M Nature. And uh, the registrar's office said they weren't able to accept Mother Nature as a co-author. So although Jay did want to credit this, I'm afraid the MIT registrar's office wouldn't allow it. This is a true story. And for me, it was an indication of the way Jay sometimes you know, can't quite be contained within the systems and communities he's part of. He's always pushing the boundaries. And uh, I think within our research group at MIT, sometimes Jay's pushing the boundaries. And I think we're all better off for it. Uh, I think it's been happening for about a decade now. I went back and looked at my email archive and I found that Jay's first email to me was almost exactly 10 years ago. It was on September 21st, 2004, almost exactly 10 years ago. And he just arrived at MIT and was in the computer science department. Uh, but was starting to look around because he wasn't feeling, didn't feel quite at home there. He was looking for other places where he felt, where he was looking for a place where he felt he could make more of a difference in the world to do things that felt more connected with the things that were most important to him. And I really appreciate the fact that he did reach out. Uh, and we did some back and forth. And then actually later that year, he took a course that I taught. Uh, and that's when I think we really made a connection. Because it was right when this 2004, we were just starting to work on our Scratch software. The, the ultimate got, was released to the world in 2007. And in the early stages, we had some sense of direction we wanted to, to, we wanted to go with Scratch. And the types, we had a sense of the type of project we wanted to support. But in fact, we didn't really know exactly how to create it. We had this image of people mixing media together in creative expression. But we didn't know how to create what it is that we were envisioning. And Jay and that course started to produce projects. And when I saw them, I said, this is what we were imagining. This is what we had in our head, but we weren't able to create. And so I knew that there was sort of a, a special bond here. And Jay then came and joined our research group. And we've been working together for most of the last decade. Uh, he's been away for the last couple of years, as, he, as he'll probably talk about, pursuing other things. But it's great that he's now sort of finishing up his dissertation work. And I think you know, in a dissertation, from the point of view of an advisor, one sees as a real success when you have a student who's able to produce things really you know, help you as an advisor see things in new ways and rethink things in new ways. I think that's definitely been true with Jay. As he's continued to push the boundaries, he's definitely helped me and I think many other people see things in new ways. I think it's appropriate, as you'll hear in his dissertation, he's trying to create tools that help people re-see the world around them. And I think Jay himself is helping, helping people see the world in new ways. So with that, I'll hand off to Jay. So like Mitch said, really this was a collaboration with, I don't know, everyone I've ever met. But um, I just put, uh, two years ago I put some of my projects on the slide, and then I tried to figure out um, who helped me the most with that project or you know, something like that. I tried to just put one name on each thing. Um, and some of the people on here are in the audience. Jeff Lieberman's there. Eric Rosenbaum's here. Um, yeah. Karen Brennan's there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> then I tried to see like how those projects uh, led to each other or contributed to each other. And then I realized every project I've done is almost influenced by, I don't know, 10 people directly and hundreds of people indirectly. And so my thank you list <laughs> can't fit on the slide. But that's also why I didn't feel right leaving the co-author uh, totally blank, like Mitch said. Um, and I really was being serious, but I get that you know, like, um, you're supposed to have single authorship on a PhD thesis. But it just isn't true. Um, that's just not how it works. Um, OK, so before I start, uh, my brother wrote me a song this morning. Maybe it'll work. So um, PowerPoint doesn't really like to play sounds. Oh, there we go. I'm only going to play like 10 seconds. 
Jay's gonna be famous pieces today. Jay's gonna be famous pieces today. Jay's gonna be famous pieces today. You'll be okay. <laughs> so that goes on for a couple minutes over some different things. And he wrote it in Kenya Dawson style for me, so I thank him for that. PowerPoint. Um, so I'll try to, uh, to the great joy of an you analytic thinkers out there, I will actually introduce my idea before I start into an experiential narrative. <laughs> the uh, lens cross block idea is the idea that you can take something that, like a lens, that's really a multiplication onto everything in your world. You can take like a magnifying glass or a microscope and you can look at the threads of your clothes or the rug in this room or, or like you can learn things about the wood paneling here and what's behind it and, and whether it's really solid or not and what it's made of and you can start to analyze things with the lens and in fact it works on most things in the world. For example, a magnifying glass works on anything that you can see. You can hold the magnifying glass up to and you can learn something about that. Maybe, you know, maybe things are transparent. Still, probably you could learn something. So that's a great power of the lens. Um, it really is something to learn about your entire world with. And then um, there's the power of the block. Uh, take a wooden wooden block construction kit, for example. You can build like innumerable forms with it. Um, but the weakness of the lens is that it doesn't directly catalyze you to build things the way a block does. And the weakness of the block or the construction kit, which the block stands in for, is that it does not directly catalyze you to look out into the world that you live in. You could be building with some construction kit that comes in a box and you're building with it and you could be in any room in the world, any city in the world, and it doesn't matter. Um, but if you have your lens, it matters where you are and what you're investigating could be all around you. So I'm trying to take the best of those things and combine them so that you learn to see the world around you like you would with a lens, but see it as something you can build with. See it as your construction kit itself. And that is what I hope people can uh, see the world and you as, as a viewpoint, the world as if it were a construction kit. So I'll explain that several more times. Um, so, uh, you know, if you see an object in the world, you might use no tool at all, or your eye, or whatever, same thing, no tool. And then if you re-see it, you might use like an x-ray, or a magnifying glass, or like a, even a technique, it doesn't have to be a tool. A technique, let's take uh, cross-sections of things and learn something about them. Uh, and if you make something, well, you can make it with a traditional construction kit. Here we have like a marble block and a mallet and a chisel. And, um, you know, this is a construction kit standed in for here by a block. Well, you can, you can make something that way. Um, but none of these things is what this thesis is about. Even though I would say like this and this are interesting, maybe the one on the left, not so much. But this is what the thesis is about, which is to see this thing that you could see differently or see according to definition brought to an end without any open-ended consideration. To see that thing as something you can build with. In this case, we're building by carving, but you can build lots of ways with every object in the world. And this idea of the viewpoint, um, which here is represented by this restaurant that I like in California, this is an example of a vision of a viewpoint onto the world. At Cafe Gratitude, the viewpoint that they're advancing using their tool, which in their, their case is a restaurant, um, is that the world is bountiful. And in the picture on their sign, you see the world and the orchard seems bare, but in the reflection of the woman's glasses and in her mind's eye, the world is bountiful. And so in that sense, I'm trying to advance this vision that the world isn't necessarily bountiful, although that's beautiful, but in this thesis, that the world itself is a construction kit, it's malleable, it's not fixed, the person looking onto the world can see that the world has musical scores, uh, electrical components, chemistry kits, architectural construction kits, um, and uncarved blocks, maybe with Banksy drawing things on them or something like that. Um, and so to say that in one sentence, um, I'm trying to make some tools that lead to this, re-seeing the everyday world as something we can remake. So the everyday world that we live in is something we can remake. Okay, that's already true. But how can we give people tools that catalyze this behavior and we can watch them then start remaking the world? Um, can we make tools that do that? And so I'm going to call that tool a constructive lens. This is a metaphorical rendition of it. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily look like a magnifying glass. But when you 
use it and act on the world with this constructed lens, the world and the everyday objects in the world, such as a toaster, start to look reconfigurable. Um, maybe they're made of components. You start to see that they're made of components. Maybe you start to feel motivated to rearrange the way those components work, and uh, then the everyday objects become some new, have some new function designated not by a designer hired by uh, a production company, but designated by you in your house or in your backyard or in your pool or whatever. Um, and so <clears throat> this is based on a few different fields. And uh, I'll go into what these fields are. But let's just imagine that a lens is good for inquiry learning. A block or a construction kit is great for learning through constructionism. But what tool would you use to learn with bricolage? Well, let's first figure out what these things are. So inquiry-based learning um, is like learning by asking questions. Um, it's experiential. It's inter an interaction with the environment. Um, and Eleanor Duckworth's book is called The Having of Wonderful Ideas. And I would say she's an inquiry-based learner, who also like a Frarian learner, but anyways. Um, but the, the name of her book is telling, the having of wonderful ideas. It's not the enacting of those ideas. And people do enact them as they have them. But I think there's something about inquiry that does not lead to uh, direct rebuilding and direct construction, as focused as some other fields could. Now, constructionism does lead to that type of building directly. Um, and constructionism is defined, uh, as best as I can say it, um, for me, that you learn best when you're building um, projects that you personally care about. Um, and so constructionism puts forth all these construction kits that you can build things with. Um, and uh, yet, um, I guess one of the weaknesses is that these construction kits generally, historically, from the constructionism perspective, haven't led you to look at the world you live in and try to reform that. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen at all. In fact, I list some good examples of when it does go in that direction. I'm trying to push in that direction even further and get rid of more computation and get this kind of instant feedback where you've got your tool and you're kind of probing the environment, but you're like making something, but then you're testing and making as fast as possible, as simple as possible, with as least computation as possible. And um, and then and that kind of these combination of these two fields kind of lead kind of leads to this idea for me of, of bricolage, like constructionism and inquiry kind of happening at the same time. Um, but there really is no tool for bricolage, like maybe a, a trash pile, but you can't give someone a trash pile. It negates the fact that it's a trash pile. You have to discover a trash pile and collect it and keep it around and become familiar with it and love the little pieces of it and know where all the parts are. Um, and so, uh, you know, in a sense, bricolage defies uh, the need for a tool. Um, and yet, I wonder if we can introduce tools that would cause things like this to happen. Um, and so I'm proposing that we can introduce a tool that would be appropriate for this field of repurposing everyday objects. So about nine years ago, I was on a nature walk in uh, Ken Burn Orchards that actually Magic Seth put together through Ross Picard's group. And um, we had this young guy, he was 19, and uh, obviously he didn't know more than me because I was like 25. So I had that on top of him, plus I was an engineer. <laughs> and uh, he was showing us around doing bird calls, and I was like, oh, that's, I don't know why I'd want to do a bird call, but whatever. He said that I ran him back, and he was like starting fires with, you know, without a lighter, and I'm like, well, I have a lighter. <laughs> Again, not impressed. <laughs> and, uh, then uh, he's like, Jay, you're not getting this. And I'm like, OK. He's like, look, look here on the ground. I want you to tell me what you see. I'm like, yeah, I don't see anything. So I'm going to be back in five minutes. Five minutes? What would I look at for five minutes? So I'm looking. And I don't see anything. And he comes back after five minutes. And I'm like, it's a trick question. I don't know, mud, poop, something. Like, I can't see anything there. There's bug, a bug crawl through. It's not there anymore. No, uh, Jay, look, look, look like this. He traces his hand. Oh, it's an animal print. Yeah, I see that. It's in there all along. OK, an animal print. He's like, yeah, Jay, a deer hoof. It's a deer hoof. And we go on on the walk. And then everywhere we go, I see all kinds of animal prints. But I've never seen animal prints in the forest before. I don't know why. I guess they're probably always there. I guess animals live in every forest. <laughs> and so I wondered, what else am I not seeing that's just been there all along? Really, our attention is focused. And so what else has been invisible to me? Um, maybe my whole life. Um, and so you see this in um, people who aren't trained, people who don't know what they're supposed to know. This is a, 
a young person's first ever interaction with snow. Um, actually, that young person's over there. Um, and you know, like, what is, is it, this feels cold, you know, probably pre-language even, right? But the experience of cold and, oh, what does it do? And what does this look like? What happens if I touch it? And again, this is a young person's first experience here in Boston with pollen. Um, and, you know, like, what's the structure of that? Why is it moving like that? I mean, probably not linguistically, but experientially, these kinds of thoughts might be, image, imagery thoughts might be in their mind. And this is kind of the beginner's mind. And to have a beginner's mind to not know is to be able to know anything, to, be, to allow for anything to be possible, because there's no constraints there yet. So, in thinking about these things, um, I started interviewing nature awareness gurus. So this is one it. of my favorites. You can see it on TV, you can hear about it, you can be lectured about it. But when you can take a stethoscope in the spring and put it on the outer bark of a tree, and you can hear the pulse of that sap being pulled up, and, you know, water being pulled up from the ground, that sap pumping up rhythmically up until the branches of the buds unfold and take one person at a time and get them through. So like, you know, like I emailed Mitch and said, oh, i got to have help doing research at MIT. No one's doing this. I also found Ann Spurn, who was doing research on this kind of stuff, seeing the city as if it was nature. Because it was cool to do the nature walk, and, and the nature awareness gurus taught me a lot of things. But I lived in the city, and I needed to see the city as if it was nature. And this is the cover of Ann Spurn's book. And she actually teaches a class that you guys could probably still take um, on urban uh, architecture. Urban, what's that kind of architecture where you, landscape architecture, urban landscape architecture. Um, and I interviewed all her students. You can see this on my website. And one of the students had this project, the LP Final Project, where he went and he made these wind maps. So this is a wind map. He licked his finger. He stuck it in the air. It's over there in Boston. Um, and, uh, and at the corner of Mass and Marlboro, there's this, you know, this, uh, like there are in a lot of places in Boston, there's this courtyard. And these are buildings. And he licked his finger, stuck it in the air, drew an arrow at every point which way the wind was blowing. I don't know how he got the curve he wanted, arrows. But, it's, but anyway, this is kind of a map of the wind over time. And, and then I'm like, oh my god, what's here? And so I went there. And it was nothing and everything at the same time. It was a trash pile. And, and it was created by the wind patterns. And I thought, this is really amazing. I need, to, I need to do this myself. And I need to make tools that help people map out you know, where, where magical things like this are in the world. And so right away, I went and grabbed some Pico crickets. And I made a, a four temperature to color converters. And with Pico crickets, it only took a couple hours to do that. And here you see like red's like the hottest. And each one has a little. Um, temperature sensor on it, and blue is like the coldest, and that's like a laptop, hot laptop in a cold room. Actually, it's the old meeting room over in the old building. That room's really cold, and, and laptops six years ago were really hot. So anyway, there's a temperature gradient coming out from the laptop. Like I've got to make more tools like this. There's got to be like inputs that I can map to outputs, and there's got to be some way to embody those and some physicality. And so first, it was going to be like a railroad building block set, or like temperature on the left, and maybe some memory interposing and color on the right, and you can mix and match these things. And, and eventually, it was like, no, I'm, I'm doing a lot of time-lapse photography. Maybe it's a camera model where the, the sensors are lenses, and the actuators are viewfinders, and you can mix and match them that way. So this isn't a rendering. This is like actually built out of you know, laser cutters or whatever the world runs on around maybe lab. Um, <laughs> cherry wood and, and plastic and things. And, um, and you can mix and match, like, you know, like look at carbon dioxide as a color or listen to temperature as a sound and kind of mix and match and make recordings or make time lapse recordings um, or just explore live you know without recording the way cameras do it was just then actually that cameras were starting to do that it used to be that you had to take pictures and look at them later um, and so and literally I would put like lenses into this thing like this is one of the battery covers has a magnifying glass the neck strap at first was a stethoscope, but that got to be too ridiculous. But this is stethoscope kind of a lens amplification of sound, just the way a magnifying glass is for light. And so here's an example of it being used to explore the different temperatures on the top of a um, sewer cover right next to Bexley on Mass Ave. And I did all these tests with it. And here's one of them where um, you know uh, we explored for a while. And, and great, there were great results. You can look at my master's thesis. Um, and and um, this young woman. Uh, found that she was able to see new things that she hadn't seen before. Um, but when it came time to take action or make changes to the world, 
the lens model wasn't working out, and this was true of the different subjects that I tried. And I, someone pointed out I didn't follow up with them years later. Um, and this led me to create this uh, model of the way a person engages with the environment through an instrument. And in this case, uh, the instrument comes between the person and the environment, and wah, 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 camera I chose wrong, because what I want is the person to engage directly with the environment, come into physical contact, make lasting change, get to know it intimately, become intertwined with it. And so the instrument really needs to be on the exterior or, a, in the best case, instrument transcendence, where you don't need the instrument for anything and you're in close intimate contact and knowledge of your environment. So it was time for another adventure. Um, so I went to visit the Guayani natives in Costa Rica. And I actually walked along this coastline from Punta Blanco. This is the border of Panama. Um, and it's about a three hour walk and you have to go at low tide because um, it's covered at high tide. And they had a sack of beans and a sack of rice each 10 pounds, because that's what you trade for staying there. And what I saw was really amazing, and I didn't plan this out, but what I saw was they could see their environment as something they build with so directly that they don't even care. They grab leaves, they make shingles for their houses, like literally while I'm there at the roof, they can grab a leaf, you know, um, just like uh, the circuit breaker went out or something. And, um, and they would make medicine. I got bit by the 200 chiggers, and they made medicine out of plants. And, um, I watched this woman peel back these palm fronds for like for two days. One day she was peeling the str you know strings are inside a palm frond. I mean I didn't know that, but each palm frond you can peel all these little strings off a long way. You can't really tear a palm frond horizontally so easily. And um, <clears throat> and then she would like rub the strings the threads together to make slightly bigger threads and then weave the threads together. And over two days she made this bag which actually <laughs> just returned to me. I haven't seen it in three years. It's an awesome bag. <laughs> Dyed with natural plant materials and woven out of, I don't know if they're officially palm fronds, but that's what they look like to me. Um, actually, I wouldn't normally just pass stuff around, but it's pretty badass. Um, and so as the materiality of this purse was coming together in front of me, kind of like the material of the universe was unraveling for me, because I was realizing everything they have, they made out of their environment. I mean, I brought them some beans and rice, you know, things like that, but like most of what they had, and then I realized everything we have is made out of something you dig up out of the ground, with very few exceptions. I'm sure someone here could think of something that comes from outer space. But like, really, we dig everything up out of the ground, or it's made of a plant or a rock. So like, everything we have, like this projector and <laughs> this like, rug. And so I couldn't believe that, right? So, and again, we see this in in little people. Um, I gave this book to my son because I'm a good hippie dad. I wanted to learn to love the moon. I gave my son also this construction kit. You now it's non-rectilinear, and it's you know learns about you learn about balance and natural form, fractal geometry. Great, gave it to him, and um, you know I thought I thought he would learn what I wanted him to learn. <laughs> but it turns out that if people don't know what they're supposed to do, they just try stuff. And so this is like two hours in, not right away, but he's just goofing around. He has nothing to do, and so he's just goofing around, playing with the two things. And eventually, over time, he starts to make pretty much like a weapon. <laughs> or it looks like a catapult. Maybe a catapult is a better way. And he enlists us in helping him, because I guess our hands are stronger. Um, and, and so I'm like, oh, well, who's doing this? And I think it might have been Leah or maybe Edith or someone that referred me to Andy Goldsworthy. And um, Andy Goldsworthy was really inspiring to me. And it turns out he's doing this all the time in nature. He walks into nature with nothing except maybe gloves and clothes finds things there and makes, I guess, art. And so this is a sorting of leaves by hue very carefully, so it looks like a hue fade. And um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, he went out to a beach. You can see this in Rivers and Tides, his movie. Um, he went out to a beach, and he broke off some icicles. It's very cold. And he got a little stone that made a bowl, put some seawater in it, and starts to you know, use his breath and the seawater and the coldness of the air to start to reform the icicles into a new shape, in this case, mimicking a river. And in the movie, he does it over four days. And each day, oh, the sunrise too early, and it melts, and he's devastated. It's so beautiful. And on the fourth day, he finishes, you know, and then the sun rises, and it's all good. And it's really this nice use of repurposing everyday world. So I'm like, OK, I can do this. So I took some kids at Not Back to School Camp, um, where I'm a counselor for camp for high school. <laughs> and I uh, showed them the book, the Andy Goldsworthy book, showed them some examples. OK, make something. In the first five minutes, make some geometric form. I don't care what kind. So this guy made a triangle underwater. You see the first two legs, and he's putting down the third under a flowing stream. This is a oak leaf made out of other oak leaves. This is a leaf tied to a stick with a 
blade of grass, and after about an hour, you get these beautiful forms. Um, you know, hue fades on a wreath, and birch bark used in contrast to get that contrasted color, and uh, <clears throat> the negative space between leaves showing a kind of swervy shape um, as, as the foreground sticks and leaves stuck into a mushroom. And this guy, he showed this, and he said, everyone was like showing their final project. He's like, this is fire. And someone said, oh, how did you get those sticks to stick up on that tree? And he said, I don't know, but I can show you how. And so verbally, he didn't know. But somehow, his body knows, and his intuition knows. So pre-verbally, somehow, he does know. And since he doesn't know what it's supposed to do, like, you know, when we don't know what things are supposed to be, we have rooms to suppose that what they could be, to suppose how they could, how they could work. Um, and so about this time, uh, I was doing all this nature sensing, and I went over to India. And we were playing with nature sensing, with, uh, in this case, a pico cricket, sometimes scratch board, pico board. And these kids are listening to objects because we have it set up to convert resistance to sound. So the resistance of these objects is being converted to sound. Oh, listen to the metal. Listen, listen to this plastic. Listen. Just using around, touching the probes. And actually, the next day we had a new circuit I'll tell you about in a minute. They're dipping it into the plant soil. Two separate pots. Somehow this conductivity between the two separate pots, that was surprising to me at first. It turns out clay pots are permeable and concrete conductive and asphalt isn't and all these other things that I learned. The sound of flowers, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, actually um, I took this circuit, right, uh, that they were using and I hacksawed off the piano part. This isn't really a piano circuit. You're supposed to touch a metal wand to the metal keys of the piano and it connects a circuit and it plays different sounds. Well, while I was making that, um, and Evelyn is here, and I don't know if you were awake or not at the time, but I, so, like I said, probably you were awake without wanting to be because it was beeping so much. Um, <laughs> I spilled some doll on it, and I eventually realized, like, hey, this thing squeaks without the metal wand. It's actually, you just bridge the resistance with anything in the world that's resistant. So we got rid of the piano part, and then it was working kind of like a pico cricket, but kind of in tighter iterations with louder sounds and higher sensitivity. And I took a cue from the Indian kids and cut apart the plastic bottle and made a little curious caterpillar. Um, where the two antennas could touch the things and you could listen to them. Um, and so at this point, we've basically got, as Feldmeyer knows, a triple five timer in a stable mode with um, you know, one of the resistors replaced by stuff like people and, and the world and things like that. So it's an old, 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 old circuit. We're just taking a resistor out and we're saying, let's touch it to things. Even that's not totally original. And um, over time, we start putting on a pencil um, because graphite's conducted, which I learned from Jeff Lieberman sitting right there. Um, and uh, eventually made it onto a mechanical pencil, showed it at the Maker Fair, put it into a paintbrush, started showing it in fashion shows and museums, made a jacket called OK to Touch. And what I realized in me inventing all these things is that this thing is an invention kit and I should give it to other people and let them invent things with it. So uh, with some more free, we put it on the market as an invention kit. This thing isn't a squeaky circuit. You can invent things with it. And we made this video of what you can do with it. So you can attach it to pencil. You can take it right off the pencil, hook it up to a paintbrush, regular paintbrush. And water conducts electricity, so you can get varying sounds through your body and through the water and through the brush. Leather is a great conductor. I'm sorry, I've been using this conductor for years of conductors. Uh, it's great for water. And uh, the kitchen sink in the old kitchen here in the media lab. That old conducted, flowing water conducted, which I first learned with uh, Mary, with you, going to see Jeff's show. I was playing with the sink. I didn't know flowing water would be conducted before that moment. <laughs> uh, and so we made this video and we put it on. Um, one one had posted a terrible video that didn't explain how diverse it was. And so I said, hey, you have to post this other video. Um, so we posted that video. And um, we put out the kit. And um, I'm going to show you some of the things that I did with people, and then some of the things that happened in the wild. So um, these are six of the 19 workshops I ran with Draudio, uh, represented by just one picture each here. And I'll show some examples from them. This is the National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts. This young woman made uh, a mushroom organ with hot glue and resistors and electrical tape. 
And at the same workshop, um, this young man made a kind of parallel circuit where you could touch a number of different things and get a lot of different sounds going. Um, the muffinator who is sitting back there um, actually made this at an MIT IAP workshop. It's called, uh, what's it called? Stradia. Oh, yes, Stradia. <laughs> um, and as you drink through the straw, the different resistors in the resistor ladder are bridged, and the different oh, sounds. Nice. Uh, Unlike the, the straw in the video, which had a continuous flow of water, this jumped uh, a pitch every time you got a little higher. And, um, and this is the hula looper made at Not Back to School Camp. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit more about that. Um, let's see, do I have a video of that? Okay. So here it is in action. Um, and uh, this person is decided to be named. Her name is Claire. And uh, she was 15 at the time, and her collaborator, Isaac, who just went on stage. And right here we have three different pitches put to her shirt with three different pairs of copper tape being bridged by the hula hoop, which has copper tape on the inside of it. Uh, so you hear three different sounds. And um, I, in the thesis I put you know, the entire dialogue, which is about 10 minutes. So this is about, I don't know, 50 seconds worth of the interaction. And um, one interesting thing that happened was this wasn't part of the planned workshop. This is people who, after the workshop, were like, hey, I was doing something else. I want to participate. And so it's this beautiful, open, I call it what I end up calling open prologue. It wasn't planned that this would happen this way. Um, and uh, so some interesting things you see are like some ideation in green and uh, different forms of appreciation, very natural forms of people flowing in and out uh, with up to 12 onlookers at different times through the 10 minutes. Um, appreciation, you know, that sounds like and things like that that people were saying. And you also see um, things that I think, like, when Isaac was making this in pink, he's, like, making this, and this is, like, you know, eight-tenths of the way through, and he's like, wow, people are really appreciating this, and, oh, we really love hula hoops here. Like, the hula hoop wasn't something I brought. They make their own hula hoops. Hula hoops are part of the culture. So it has this huge, it's a huge, like, it's important. It's like, uh, you know, I, I, a media lab would be like a laptop or something. It's like, hula hoops, we do everything with those. We, we, you know, we email each other with those. So it's a really important thing. And, and so Isaac's like, wow, I made this happen. He didn't say it so loud, but it was caught on audio. And, um, and he's just reflecting on it. And, um, and also they discuss you know, who deserves credit for what, and I thought that was nice. And all this is happening in this free-flowing way. Um, and so later I interviewed Claire again, um, a couple years later, actually. Um, and uh, I, didn't, I interviewed a few people after the fact, and I didn't get this um, from anyone else, but I did get from Claire that she felt that using Draudio made her think about using the world in a different way. Um, and this was before any popularized talks that I'd given. So it, it felt authentic, um, but you can look at the transcript and decide for yourself. Um, so also did a lot of workshops in Silicon Valley. This one was at Bump. That's a startup. This is a beer pong table made with from Adradio. And you can look in the thesis to see dozens of examples from each workshop. Um, and this was at MIT Sponsor Week. Someone made a book of different uh, musical drawings that you could probe. And uh, at Intel, um, this guy uh, made, this engineer made uh, a field of copper tape that a vibrobot could walk over and make different sounds depending on where it touched. Um, and out in the wild also, we saw hundreds of things out in the wild, roughly. Um, on the left is a synthesis slicer, um, and on the right is a musical <laughs> puppet. And they were made by professional designers, in this case, using Gradia. Um, and so what you start to get um, is a little bit of an idea that the world could be seen as a circuit, or, or maybe as a resistor. You know, it depends how you look at it. Um, but in this case, I've drawn you know, a conductive path through the world. Um, that's my circuit diagram. Always put people in your circuit diagram. And so um, replacing from before, you can kind of see how the circuit diagram includes the world. So world as circuit, well, it turns out at Media Lab, we have something that's a lot like that. Uh, we have this thing that I was really inspired by that you guys have all seen called Iobra. And in Kinnikos thesis, well, let me, let me not get ahead of myself. This is awesome. You grab swatches from the everyday world and use them as paint. So you don't have paint in terms of nothing. You have to go get paint. And you can do cool stuff. Um, and so in this case, her thesis was called World as Palette, meaning the world is a place where you go get paint from, because that's what the palette is, a place where you go get your paint from. World as Palette, that was the topic of her thesis. Um, and I very much like the, 
concept and the video representation and the thesis topic. And so I wondered, I started to wonder, if I'm doing world as circuit, she's doing world as palette, is there this whole thing, world as this, world as that, and can you actually generalize it to be world as construction kit? And so the first time I got that into a kind of a chart, it looked like this. And, and this chart is to help you to like make world as, you know, whatever, palette, uh, garden, uh, you know, dance, theater, whatever it is, whatever your expressive form is. Um, so this, the rule that I made is you take your construction kit and you break it up into components. Yeah, not everything is going to fit perfectly, but whatever. Let's see what happens. So you've got loose parts, tools, and substrates. Every construction kit fits into those three categories if you force an hard time. <laughs> and let's take a paint kit, which Timika was using, and, um, and let's look at you know, the paint, the brush, and the canvas, because I'd say you know, if you're going to do traditional painting, probably you're going to have those three things. And um, I made a rule that says, OK, take one of those things away. Take away the paint. OK, here's your painting kit, beginner painter. But you don't have paint anymore. You have to go find it now. Um, and so you know, someone might scavenge around and find some berries and smush them up, or mix something with oil, or use a blender or mix Cheerios with Elmer's glue, and you start to get these different paints that emerge. And, um, and that's kind of a non-technological world as palette or world as paint. Um, and you can do this with all the components. Take away the brush, OK. Well, what can we use as a brush? Well, uh, my wife used to teach this creative arts class uh, in preschool where you, you, know, you use spaghetti and race cars and whatever toys are in the room become the brush, and you dip them in the paint, and you draw with them. Um, and, and so you take away the canvas, and that kind of predicts the world of graffiti or, or maybe tattoo art or you know, whatever it is. Um, now you're painting on, you, know, you go find things, paint a rock. You know? it's, it's fun. Good. Um, and you can put this into the digital world, too. And, and with paint, uh, to some degree, this is already the case. And paint is, in a sense, one of the prototypical ex expressivity kits, one of the prototypical art forms. So uh, you, know, you take away the paint, as you already saw, you get I.O. brush. You take away the brush, well, maybe you use light emitting object or light reflecting objects as your brush, as in the case with um, light painting with long exposure photography. Or you know, you use you know, your strong projector, your laser projector. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, so there's a rule there. So uh, turn your construct, if you want your construction kit or your art kit, which I'm just going to you know, piss off all the artists and say, that's a construction kit right now, because I'm trying to think about it that way. And just, Make it be a construction kit with those components, and um, and then you know take one of them away and say you have to find it in the world. And then you have you know world as gardening kit. You know you have to see if, you, if that works. But that's the idea. Um, and then I went to uh, you know like some traditional kits, for example Lego's traditional building kit. And I found that actually Lego's pretty closed, what I would call closed, and closed in the sense that it interacts and interoperates with itself really, really well. It only has like one simple rule, maybe two: push to connect, pull to disconnect. Pretty, that'll get you pretty far. Um, and so it's amazingly interoperable. And in fact, they pride themselves on system and play and interoperability within their system. But rarely, if ever, have I seen Lego by design, on purpose, encourage people to take their Legos and mix them with the world they live in. And so I thought, OK, well, um, you know, here's some simple ways. Make one that floats. Make one that has an eyelet so you can tie it to things. Give it a suction cup so you can put it on your window. Um, you know, make it sticky. <laughs> make it so it snaps to other objects. And since then, people have made Lego you know, interoperability kits, other uh, construction kits. Or make a little pocket that you can insert like, you know, printouts from your printer, put little pictures in with it. You know, just like make it so that it expects that the world exists. Because the world exists outside of the Lego system. So, so when you design your kits, treat it as part of the whole system. And so, um, so these are some suggestions which I later formalized to turn into methodologies for opening traditionally closed kits. And I also noticed in doing this that everyone's talking about open-ended projects, and, and only recently, and, and as Mitch points out, really not everybody is talking about it. <laughs> but, I, but I wish everybody was. And now if you talk to a teacher about an open-ended project versus 10 years ago, instead of them being like, oh, I don't know, they're like, I want to do it. How do we do it? They're on board usually. So the world's gone a long way. Um, but what you have to notice is that it's not just the end of a project that, that can be, um, be non-single pointed. Um, every part of a project has a chance for being open. And you wouldn't want every part of a project to be open. But let's take a look at you know, like, uh, open beginning, for example. Well, I'm saying this means you don't know what materials you're starting with. Okay? Let's look at open epilogue. What happens when the project's done? Is that just when, the pro when does it go in the trash can and disappears or something? No, like projects have a lifespan. Um, 
And so what normally people call open-ended doesn't include the epilogue of the project. But you can decide whether or not a project should be placed somewhere and live on. You know, um, you plant a garden, should that live on in your bike basket? Or, uh, you know, usually in a raised bed or something like that? Or should it be in a hat? You know, this is an open epilogue question if you want it to be. And you don't want all these things to be open, but you just need to consider. You might have a closed uh, phase within your activity, and you could use this rubric to think, well, is that part open-ended? Do I want it to be? Um, so looking um, out into the world to see what kind of kits already exist, you can actually find these on most uh, toy store shelves, like uh, mom and pop toy store shelves. And um, they actually ask you to scavenge you know, stuff. Um, and it's called make-do. Um, and you know, Subaru, people use it around here. And they explicitly encourage you to repurpose things and stick them together. Unlike duct tape, which I think acts much like Subaru, but but without the support materials directly suggesting it, um, I would argue that that's just as wonderful to do, but the duct tape company is not catalyzing the action to happen where the Subaru is. Um, so I come back to this chart, and at this point I didn't have the table yet, but what I started to do was turn this chart into a table in my head. I just didn't know how to make tables that well then. Of this table that kind of predicts all of these binary pairs of input synesthetically paired to an output. Um, and it ends up predicting, you know, it's not so direct, like I didn't just follow the chart and I was done. But it ends up predicting all these things that I later made, which I'll now show you about one by one. Um, I'll just very briefly cover these because they're not the point of the thesis. 20 seconds each. So this takes sound in and converts it to color and also sound out. These functioning figures. That's that Richmond house right there. So taking sounds from everyday objects and remixing them. Looking to the world as if to say, what sound is in you? You know, if I knock on you, if I point you know, looking to the world as if it were a palette of sounds. Um, so world as sounds or world as audio sampling palette. Um, and I should mention that every single one of these was a collaboration, you know, ultimately with a lot of people, but with Eric Rosenbaum, who's in the audience. Um, and uh, so then taking light as an input and sound as an output, it's almost just like Draudia, which is called Frankl. And just taking colors and converting them to notes. That's all this does. Just taking the color, in this case, colored markers. In this case, Legos. Linear in this case. In this case, more sculptural. And in this case, going off of Legos to just random stuff. Um, and, and then, you know, like thinking about Twinkle, like, OK, color in, sound out. And I'm starting to think at this point more computationally. And I'll, I'll show how in a minute. But starting to think, how can color come in and like computation come out, whatever that means. And this is a very small clip. And I just want to prepare you at the end. Bill Mayer will be in it if you want to emerge uh, But uh, here, blue just means eat the cookie. OK, so it's simple. But you know, then you're just sitting in the cube. You grab a postcard. You grab your necklace, your amber, two soothing necklace, and you have a fishing pole. And so the point is, like, when colors, colors are so understandable by people, so readily available. And all objects have them. I wrote a paper where I called it Visual Frequency Identifier, VFID. Most things have a VFID. It's not a one-to-one -one map. Your leaves are used as platforms and platform the game. And um, there's a lot more examples I can show. Um, this is a musical composition example. So we can show you can program computers, very simple programs, you can color from objects. Like that. um, so that's the that part of Feldmeyer's over now. So um, and uh, right. And so um, I was really thinking, how can we have these constructions? I'm sorry, have these constructions get to be computational? And so um, I'm back in India doing this summer workshop again with Pita Narayan. And she's not still in town, right? She was in town last week. Cool. Um, and so uh, we ran this workshop where we said, take pictures of nature. And so the kids in this school, Trisha, the Islam school, they took their cell phones, well, our cell phones, and took pictures of nature. And then we made a map of their city using those pictures, making a 3D paper diagram. And then even noticing that you know, maps are pretty bad representations of reality, since reality moves around, making some uh, you know, part, uh, notation on the map that how, on the chalkboard how that map might change over time and how it's really a system and not a fixed thing. And um, I'll show you a video of this in a second. But then taking uh, those, those in motion 
uh, ideas and putting them into little uh, scratch projects that ran on mobile devices about six years ago, Nokia 8 and 810s, and embedding them in the paper craft, really merging the paper with the um, with the computation. <laughs> so really trying as much as possible to merge the computation into the paper. And literally we're putting the inside of the laying down front of my board and representing the part of nature that and then ultimately then taking this map, cutting it apart, and bringing it to the small on site to tell a story to the people. And so uh, one of my favorite stories is actually about slums. So moving around the, the slum village and taking the little pieces of the map and installing them on site, having a discussion about what that means for that. And I, I really found it was part of um, this, this paper craft that people were so familiar with. Um, it's just really beautiful when people have a, a years of experience using something and uh, can suddenly merge computation, which they have to try hard to get working, but they're a master of this other thing that they've had experience with. And I'll just say that the formation of this project as awareness mapping was performed with Karen Brennan here. Um, and moving on, we did some computer crafting at Not Back to School Camp. There you see a scratch project embedded in somebody's hat. And this was my Halloween costume one year. And the louder you got, the faster my heart would beat. And I was a surgeon with a knife operating on myself. <laughs> and this kind of new focus on computation in color code and also in Draudio led me to think, how can I hook the Draudio up to the computer? There's this beautiful interaction with touching water, with drawing pictures. And um, over the course of a few years, Eric and I figured out how to do this. And this was a sample project uh, space video that we put out surrounding what was possible with that. So you can take everyday objects, in this case, Play-Doh. And you go online, and you Google for stuff, and find things that already exist, apps that already exist, and you put something together. Regular pencil graph, right? Can think about this, we already know. He's acting as switches now, not as Those are actually the plastic doors from my target dresser. You just fill them with water, you go get Dan Finn's from the And those are, those are examples of games. Now we go into the music section. Because this is actually a sample project space that I'm showing you. It's carefully crafted. It's got games, music, and inventions. Here's the music. Got dope. This is my cat. This is now the inventions portion. <laughs> it turns out cat's pads are conducted, their tongue is conducted, but the fur is not. Eric wanted to do this one. I said, no way, it's going to take hours. I forced him to do all the hard work. Um, and actually, there was a third invention, which was a gong that made you go to the next Pandora song, but the visuals just weren't right. So there's supposed to be three of each category, invention, game, and music. And um, well, I'll come back about some theory, but let me just show you what some people did out there in the world. So these are user-generated videos, or creator, or participant-generated videos. That's the Star Spangled Banner um, by Eating Lunch, which won a talent show. Um, cardboard guitar, playing Minecraft. <laughs> it's actually someone we know at the Exploratorium, so not truly in the wild. <laughs> Again, showing the conductivity of the cat, mostly near the mouth and feet area. A little bit on the air. This is a musical dinner that someone did. It's like a 10 hour video of this song somewhere. We'll be having a complete viewing of it after the video. Um, this guy was saying, hey, I can't buy one of these bass guitars. It's too expensive. He did this beautiful performance with it. I don't really understand how sawdust was conducted in the middle there. I'm pretty sure it's sawdust. It could be something else. Maybe they're wet. Just taking some notes, that's a clear example of job. This is actually in a workshop with the game. And this was in the wild, this was a private agency. There's actually a lot of advertising agencies using this. I think it's like all the karaoke. This is not truly in the wild, because it wrote the in it, but he kind of did it out of his own passion. And so I felt it was the next one. I don't know if I advocate this, but it was interesting. 
I think it's because I have an obsession with food and I'm addicted to food. But I also really like dipping sauce. I think it's truly an innovation. This is a Pizza Hut commercial that someone made with me. If anyone wants to, I'll be here for a week. If you want to eat pizza with dipping sauce, I'll be available. <laughs> Um, and so kind of just wrapping up some of these ideas, um, some of these things where, you know, like with the open Lego kit where you're or, or with Makey Makey or any of these things, we're taking materials and bringing them into your, into your construction kit. That's what I call importing. And I have a number of uh, strategies for that. And when you, whenever you take something from your construction kit and put it out in the world to live on, I call that exporting. And you're familiar with that from software. And good software can import as much as possible, uh, probably, um, at least in the advanced options. And you can probably export to a lot of mediums. You know, if you can't export to YouTube and you have a video program, it's, it's not very helpful because you, you want your video to live in various ways out in the world. So I call that importing and exporting. And importing is roughly mapped to open middle and open beginning, whereas exporting is especially good for open epilogue where something lives on. Um, and I have this strategy, um, which I formalize a little further in the thesis, but I won't go into. And then I take the years of reading obsessively. I, ba I basically can't read a book unless it's either maybe a spiritual book or a, a book by one of these radical educators. And so I've read all these books. It's pretty much the only books I've read. And, um, and so I tried to put down my best uh, design advice from, you know, um, if you could take a person's entire work and convert it into a sentence or something, because so, you're working on your tool and you're like, I need advice. So uh, I won't go too much into it. But you know, like, if you're working with Duckworth, you know, maybe you need to run a workshop and ask people to use your kit. And when you ask them to use it, just shut your mouth and watch what they do. And if you're going to open your mouth, maybe use your mouth to ask them something about their process, to bring their process to the forefront, instead of worrying about your process. You might find out what kind of wonderful ideas they have. Uh, my advice from Steiner is to just really put yourself into the kit, because um, Steiner really has you put yourself in as a teacher. The kids don't want a lesson. They want you. They want you to be alive with them and in front of them. Your kit should be the same way. Just put the real, most important thing about yourself in there. Um, Illich's advice is maybe to try to figure out what substance you're offering somebody, what institution you're delivering your kid in. Are you offering them a process or real substance that they can grab onto? Um, you know, if you're working on something, don't forget, Montessori would say, through my mouth if I had control over it. Don't forget about um, uh, manipulatives and stations. Stations are beautiful. They're places where things are set up, different, different places in space. Um, and going on like this, uh, I'll have some more stuff about Frere, so that's okay. Um, and then, uh, well, I won't summarize Mitch since you guys already have him here. Um, and for me, my own personal takeaway from Papert is, um, you know, just don't, if you're trying to make some construction kit, just make it about the powerful idea you're obsessed with. Don't, you know, if you're not sure what to make it about, maybe you should figure out what you really think is amazingly powerful. Just make it about that. That's, that's what you should make it about. Um, and uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about sample project spaces. Because um, you make a tool. Let's say you give someone a hammer, right? Um, let's say they've never heard of a hammer, because I already started with that example. Pretty unusual situation, but imagine someone never heard of a hammer. And you give it to them. Kind of not that great. It can be interesting, maybe. But if you show somebody that they can make a house and a bench and you know, um, different la a ladder and different things that they would like to make, now a hammer becomes meaningful. So a, a tool is not a tool. A tool is a sample project space in terms of how you communicate to people about what its efficacy, meaning, and value is. So make a sample project space. And when you make your tool, your tool is, is basically meaningless, in my opinion, until you say, you can make this with it. And then you should say, you can also make this with it. And that should give you ideas in between the two uh, things that you can make. 
of other things you can make with it. And you should probably, you know, go out on a limb and make a whole space of three projects you can make. And then there's different things you can interpolate in between there. Well, now once you have that, you have your tool and you have your sample projects, and you have your, you know, interpolated things. You know, just because you interpolated these new projects that you might be able to make from your original sample projects doesn't mean your tool can make those things. So check, can my tool make those things? If not, do I need to add something to the tool? But if I add something, does that make it more complicated? And it leads to this sample space versus maybe being more simple and leading to this sample space. And is it worth the extra complication? Because you want the maximal kind of diversity and empowerment for the kind of minimal attention, focus, energy, uh, barrier to entry, that kind of thing. So ask yourself that and repeat. Um, and so I guess I'm saying that the sample project space is almost like its own domain. Um, in electrical engineering, which I had the lovely experience of spending seven years studying, on the, um, on the top left you see a picture of twinkle, twinkle, little star in the time domain. And it's kind of blurry. But even if it wasn't, um, you probably wouldn't get much out of that if you're the average person. This on the right is a spectrogram made with MATLAB of twinkle, twinkle, little star without any noise. Um, and it actually has real good information in it. And so the point is, when you switch domains, you can see things in a totally different way that you couldn't see them before. And I guess I'm saying that if I show you this and you know nothing about it, it kind of doesn't mean anything. But if I show you this, or maybe the video that's associated with this, that tells you what this tool's all about. And I call that the sample project domain. And it's really important that you should never undersell it. You should, you know, here's the Dronio video splayed out into images. This is the sample project space that I offered before people offered me anything back. Um, here's the back of the Makey Makey, uh, the first Makey Makey box I ever made. What does it have on it? Well, it doesn't have a Makey Makey. It has the sample projects that you can do. Um, because that's that's what actually does happen. <laughs> Busted! Um, <laughs> uh, the, fr the front of the new Makey Makey box has a sample project on the front. And on the back, it's all sample projects, um, three examples that you can see. Um, because that's what this thing is. And in fact, it highlights this, these bananas popping up. Well, I said, you know, we should highlight the circuit. And the designer on this project said, don't highlight the circuit. Makey Makey is all about the stuff you repurpose. And I'm like, oh, you just beat me at my own game. That's great. You're right. So we put bananas sticking up, uh, cardboard bananas. Um, and, and even in the instruction manual, right? Like, so at the beginning of the instruction manual, fine. Show the tools. Uh, and then, you know, here's a complete project example with no words. And then just start, these are instructions, right? But it turns out that it's actually instructions to build a project. So in the process of doing that, of kind of giving you step by steps, you're actually giving an example project, again, using the sample project space. And then in the instructions comes three examples of three projects you can build, all the while teaching you things, like you can make an aluminum foil wrist strap, and you can use the back of the board in addition to the front of the board. But that's not how it's played out. It's played out in a narrative anyway. So your sample project space, just never stop using it. Um, Rosenbaum created this submit your own Makey Makey project, and these are 100 of the many projects that are submitted through that. Um, and so now, now the participants are contributing back uh, projects. So kind of reflecting back on what motivated me in this direction, and, and also looking forward, what do I want to be working on now? Like, what do I still believe in that motivated me long ago? Um, I look at Gardner, and we all know about the seven intelligences and stuff, but like he wrote more books after that. And there's more intelligences, you know, even the seven was considered a lot. Wow, there's more than that. But like, and, and so he added these, but I'd say there's even more than that. So like, think about what you think an intelligence is. And I think about what I think an intelligence is. And actually, these two take me a long way. Um, and uh, also, just looking back at Papert's writing a little bit, um, and uh, in this case, a reflection that Edith Ackerman made on Papert. Edith's here in the room. Um, just thinking about like how pa Papert, maybe versus Piaget, views his child, and this really resonates with me, kind of like uh, for the very sake of feeling at one with them, right? So like, just like really considering that child as a beautiful moment. And a little bit further, this is direct from Papert now. Um, he talks about what he called in the methetics, and the word math means like the study of learning. Is that right? An angle in French? Um, I think math comes from Latin and it means learning. Um, and so, so yeah, so um, he talks about in here really what learning is about, at least in this moment when he's talking in this particular passage, is connect, connecting. And, um, you know, and he talks about connectionism. And for a long time, before I found this passage, I was looking at interconnectionism and how kind of by interconnecting with your environment, 
can you learn things about yourself and about the world, kind of as a maybe version of constructionism, or just something I was tossing around. And then I found that passage where he directly states it. Um, now, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed is basically um, textbook 101 if you're at Harvard Ed. Um, so, uh, but if you're, and Karen can tell me whether I'm right about that later. Um, but uh, if you're at MIT, you might not have, have read it. It had a big effect on me. And um, he talks a lot about conscientization. And to me, like, all of the things that I'm making are about this process of conscientization, seeing the invisible boundaries around you, moving past them, being empowered. And hopefully, all the work I do would try to resonate with people in a way that makes them kind of see where, they're, where they could move beyond their limits. So that comes back over and over again for me. And so in kind of the first half of the work at MIT, I was working on reseeing. The second half, a little more on repurposing. And um, up until now, reseeing has mostly been a kind of personal pursuit. Although with Jeff, we did work on one project that directly affected it with tools. So maybe I see some of that in my future, but not for a while. I have some more repurposing to do. And, and pretty much I feel like conscientization cuts across all of these. So let me just close with a couple of my favorite examples. These were submitted as um, proposed projects for a design contest that we ran with the Makey Makey. I really love this diagram that someone submitted. For one thing, it has a person in it, and I think every diagram should have a person in it. But also, this was a 10-year-old designing for his sister, his older sister, for her birthday party. And at her birthday party, she, had a tra uh, she has a trampoline, and she wanted to have a slideshow. And he put that together so that she could control her slideshow from her trampoline. I just thought that was really empathic, really thoughtful thing for a little brother to do, for an older sister to kind of put her as the star of the show and to make that, uh, propose to make that for her. And this dad proposed to make for his son a controller because the controller he had bought for his son had cerebral palsy and needed different accessibility options. <clears throat> it wasn't working so well, but it was expensive, and to get it changed would have cost more money. And you know, this wasn't the perfect solution, but he could make one up himself really cheaply, and when the son's hand changed functionality, he could change the controller, that kind of thing. And so since these serious projects started coming up, I thought I'd better put a really serious warning on the box. Because if like, you know, corporations were crumbling or governments were taken over, I wouldn't want anyone to not have been warned. <laughs> and we also just let people know as a little surprise when you open the box that the world is your construction kit. So I urge you the next time that you're on an escalator and an M&M &M or something falls out of your pocket, consider maybe that's not really an escalator. Maybe what someone else called it isn't what you have to call it. Maybe it's an M&M &M surfboard. Maybe take other things out of your pocket. Throw them down on the escalator also. <laughs> We were in our yard one day, and uh, my son noticed these, what he calls danger flies, and he would run around, make them move when he ran. Well, it turns out they move when you talk, too. Deep, 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 deep. And I think this next one's a high-pitched one, so I asked Joe to do it for me. So they have all these responses, almost like a graphics equalizer or something, to different audios you, you play them, so I had to play them a song. <laughs> so, I guess uh, when I was like 13 or so, I used to have this idea that I would build a utopian world because I just wanted the world to be a great place. And as I got older um, and you know, even in the last few years, what I realized was that the world I want to live in isn't even one that I can build, even if I got everything right. Um, not even one that, you know, 100 scientists or a million designers or, you know, like CEOs or politicians, none of those people can build the world I want to live in, because the world I want to live in would be built by 7 million different pairs of hands kind of coming up in their own mosaic fashion, making things the way they want them to be in their backyard, in their kitchen, and in their own place, and it's a beautiful mosaic diversity in that, and that would be um, my, my personal utopia, so I hope to live in that world someday. Thank you. We'll open up for questions now, so we'll take like 15 minutes or so for questions. And then after that, the committee will get to spend some time with Jay. So, but for right now, we'll open up questions with Jay. You can just call on people. Oh, sure. Well, you might wait till they raise their hands. Or <laughs> <laughs> Everybody I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, oh, Edith was once, a long time ago, on my 
dissertation, well, on a committee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is beautiful presentation of a long time of research that goes in a direction in which most of us should go much more into. And it has to do with learning to re-see the world and not only focusing on the making part, but making in order to gain new insight and looking at things differently in order to make things in different ways, plus the idea of the world as a palette. So I will not expand on why I find this work so important and so fundamental. Um, I am just going to uh, ask you to make clearer to me the only part where I felt you fall a little bit back from your own um, strengths. This idea of the world as a palette and to take the IO brush is extraordinary. I think another strong idea in your work is to translate from one uh, sensory domain into the other. Uh, another one is all the inputs and the outputs and the exports and the imports. There is a part about programming and controlling aspects of the world. So the world as a construction kit is a good metaphor. But I, that's the only moment where I got scared in your talk. Because I hoped that you wouldn't break down the world into components the way other people do it. And Lego is a very good example. It's to think that for anything to be in a way calcu calculable, mm -hmm. to be computationally uh, available, needs to be broken down into these units, into these atomic units. And I think that your work is extraordinary to me because what you did is to pursue this idea of building a construction kit without units, which is work that actually many people in Lea Bouchelet's work did. So I don't mean to say that you cannot you know, decompose the world into atomistic parts and that it's not important to think at what level of detail you are working. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of this work is that it blurs these boundaries. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I would like to add to your the world as a construction kit without parts. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you would agree th with this idea that it's actually very important and to just elaborate a little bit more on this notion of um, taking what, so the idea would be the world exists out there, the world is actually made of parts, but what I focus on is not the parts that anybody can divide it, but it's what I focus, what I focus now, what I focus now becomes the part. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's tied back again to what we perceive mm -hmm is what we can take as the unit to work with, so it becomes also a more psychological unit. Thank you, yeah. Um, I don't know if sorry, I can sorry, remember all the things I thought of while you were talking. But just but, this idea um, of construction kit, you know, and... Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, like, the kits are designed to not have to necessarily decompose things into parts, and I actually have a graph in my thesis that shows attention being anti-correlated with number of functions in your tool. And I've tried to pare down the functions to nothing or as little as possible, so you don't go into that cognitive analytical space, or that you don't have to go always into that cognitive analytical space, because actually a balance is important, and maybe we think of inventing and we think of making things um, maybe too often in our society as being decompositional or analytical. Um, when actually within seconds, if you're working within seconds, you're not working at the cognitive level usually. You're usually using your entire bodily knowledge to intuitively mesh things. And that's why I try to get these design cycles where someone invents something new every five seconds, even if it's kind of throwaway, not, not something special. Um, and uh, I think what you point out is like related to like Franken typing, where you just take two things and just smash them together. And you're not worried about really exactly what their parts are. You're like, what if I smash them together like this? Oh, nothing. Oh, like this? Wow, something. Um, and uh, and there is a lot in the thesis about synesthesia um, that I won't go into. 
Um, but I do like Hannah Perner Wilson's Kid of No Parts writing, and her and I were collaborating at the time that we were both thinking about kids that didn't have parts um, from Leah's group. And actually, when Leah was on my committee before she left, she actually had me calling this a creativity kit, not a construction kit. I think as soon as you go creativity kit, you get more of a paint, not blocks feel. And as soon as you have paint, well, I guess paint's probably made of atomic parts, but you're more smearing things and less building things. Um, and in fact, actually, one of Mitch's papers, um, I think it might have originally had a title floating around, like uh, building, well, I forget exactly what it was, but it was building. And Michelle Holblinka suggested maybe that should be more like sowing seeds. You know, it's more of a farmer metaphor. And as Froebel um, named kindergarten, child garden, probably the right metaphor for thinking about these complex <laughs> forms of learning and thought pattern. It's more about sowing seeds and, and providing a rich environment. I'll just stop. Thank you. I totally agree. Thank you. Leo? I congratulate you. It's a great pleasure to be here listening to you describe so much of your experience. And um, I wonder how would you represent the social within your toolkit? You know, because you always acknowledge the contributions of everyone. Yeah, well, actually, I think a weak point um, of all of, maybe like all of construction kits, or, or at least the work that I'm doing here with construction kits, is that's not, uh, it's not so socially critical sometimes. Um, I mean, there's critical components to what I'm making, definitely, and the way I talk about it, and, and you know, and the support materials and things, but there can be some lack of inherent socialness um, in a construction kit until you start to build a community around it and do all these other things, which is, do I have that diagram in here? Um, so at, at one point in my thesis, I had a table where I say, look, a construction kit isn't a tool. It is a bunch of support materials, a community around it. It is uh, you know, um, a sample project space. It is. 15 different things that I can't remember right now. So I think the social component is really important. Um, and I think, in fact, in that table I have, like, for example, a your tool day, for example, scratch day. You need to engage people to collaborate with each other around building things and things like that. But is that what you were asking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah how to bring that context. So it's not just you, just you and the tool and the world, the social. It's so much not that, yeah. Just you. Now I will continue to wonder how to really make these inanimate things totally social beyond their immediate use. Thanks, Leo. Yeah. Uh, so I think you know, in the in creativity and people making things, I I myself, and perhaps you might argue with this, but I myself like to draw a distinction between there are people, of course, on one end who just aren't creative at all, who think within boxes, and then there are people who like are able to break those bounds and are able to think creatively, repurpose things, and then there are people who are able to think creatively, but they create something that's really special, really unique, really sublime. And I was wondering, in the process of empowering people to kind of break out of their bounds, um, what's the next, what's the, like, what are your thoughts on getting people to create the sublime? How do they get there? Do they get there? Are there ways to help people get there? I hope when people look at my tool, when people use my tools, that they, you know, like at least half of them, or maybe even all of them, kind of like make these tiny steps towards creating something that nobody else has created, uh, or, or rather, sorry, to create something that changes the meaning of, of the world they live in a little bit. So to take an object that has a designated meaning and purpose, which most objects other than maybe nature-made objects tend to have, your chair has a supposed purpose, we, everyone in this room knows what it's supposed to be for, that kind of thing. And then changing that meaning just a little bit, and it doesn't have to be some huge new sublime invention. Um, even when we saw Isaac uh, having created a hula looper, which I guess is somewhat sublime, but I've seen people create much less, things that seem much less sublime to me, and have this feeling like, oh, wait, I did that. I made a small change. And it's all about these micro, micro evolutions for me. Like someone uses a tool and changes the world a little bit or repurposes something a little bit and makes something somewhat meaningful. Then they have literal proof, experiential proof, that they can do things like that. Not someone told them they can or can't, usually can't, but, but they actually have proof that they've done that before. So I guess my hope is that 
small, low bar, low barrier to entry engagements with this kind of creative, what you might call creative activity. Even tiny steps are worth anything because it breaks you beyond the zero point. But, I mean, do you have any thoughts? And, like, we, we, nobody is arguing that it's good to give people this very of entry. Like, that's all fantastic. But I, I was just wondering, do you have any thoughts on how to take people to, like, the more advanced levels of creativity where they're making more? You know, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you could probably make a study of that and try to go for it. I don't think that I don't think that my my stuff directly leads there to most people, but I that would be beautiful. I actually think it does, but it's small moments of mini epiphany. Okay. Yeah. And the and the beautiful example that he gave at, at the end is to have this thing rolling on the escalator. If you are able to not see this as an escalator and not see this just as a can that gets stuck, you have a mini epiphany. And okay, that's just a suggestion, but probably you don't have creativity with a big C and creativity with a small C. If you have lots of mini epiphanies, uh, it it's like we hit in the snow. I yeah. mean, Eminem on an escalator is sublime to me. I just didn't want to claim to everyone else that to be yeah, so I see all those things. <laughs> when someone takes a Makey Makey and hooks up a banana and plays a note, which is like super stereotypical, like I think it's totally sublime every time. So I guess it depends on your point of view. James, yep. yep. your start story, where where your nineteen year old is showing you these prints in the prints in the woods, right? You, you finally saw, and it seems like that 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 capacity to help people explore possibility space, see things that are there they just hadn't yet recognized, them, imagine what those things might represent. That 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 aha moment is is. What I think I want to riff on, when, when Leah said the social dimension, I like the blues example because so much of it had to do with how about variations on a theme? Who who did this? What other variations are possible on this? Can you can you comment on that a little bit more? That the the, the combinatoric ideation as a jazz-like social process. Oh, cool. Well, so I mean, one thing to mention there is that activities and stories and instruction manuals and kind of activity manuals can be as, and, and like, like what you're saying, that story that I started with, can be as powerful as any tool, or maybe another way to say that is a tool paired with these types of manuals or these instructions can be especially powerful. A tool by itself has no real direction. It has to have a story with it. Uh, it has to have, you know, whatever, like a, a setting. Um, as far as what you're asking about, about the combinatorial social dimensions of interacting with the tool, I mean, that's why when I taught Radical Design for Learning, I asked people to consider what learning really is, and I asked them to consider um, the founder of Burning Man as a pioneer of the new learning situations, and to consider really when does learning really happen. And in the hula hoop example, it was so beautiful, that was not a planned learning experience. I mean, yeah, I was there with the radio, and they were there at the camp, so that much was planned. Um, but there, there's a lot that goes into the camp, too, right? Like, to create these sacred spaces. I think what you're asking about for me is about creating sacred spaces. That's why I mentioned festival type experiences before that. Um, but uh, Not Back to School Camp is built as a gathering for teens, a gathering for unschooled teens. It's not just like a throw together of people hanging out. You have to sign something that says you're not being coerced to attend. All the food is provided organic and sugar free and without caffeine and this kind of stuff. Um, you're outdoors. You have a lot of things like media cut out diet things that are cut out, and a special sacred space where people are generally quite positive and open to new experiences. So to me, that social dimension is almost like temporary intentional community, and how do you create that to make a learning experience? Back here. So I want to ask you to say a little bit more about the problem. When I look at your work and you say how it comes up with construction situations, I see and move more toward thinking about the interaction. Oh, some people can't hear you too. Yeah. So you interaction as a, a here I'll help you. As, as, a, as a tension between <laughs> as a interaction and construction. So when you think about that in your design of your tools and the materials that go with it, as uh, a starting point of the experience, how what's the role of interaction for you? And the related question to that is how do you think about what traditional deconstructionist the literature, the role of the micro is as a way of getting access to powerful ideas 
what's the equivalent of a microwave for you? Yeah, good question. So what, I didn't know if you meant interaction design. What do you mean when you say interaction and construction? By interaction, I mean, let's take the last example we had. We have an escalator coming up. It's already a system that's running, right? So what you have is you introduce something in, from the world in it, and then you start sort of doing inquiry in, as a part of that interaction, right? So this distinction about where the active interaction with that comes into teasing the part whether you're doing inquiry or construction is the thing that I'm asking about. OK, well, my best answer to the first part of the question about interaction, the tension between interaction and construction is that I do think it's really important to get those iteration between interaction and construction really tight. I mean, ideally, they happen simultaneously, but maybe they don't always do that. So really shortening that time, which means simplifying the tool, having the tool be always on. So it's not this tool that you then sample, and then you know, you're developing the film later or something like that. That's not going to work. Not ideal. And um, kind of uh, not having something where there's too many modes, where you have to figure out, well, what mode do I want to do? Well, that's a question about the tool. Eliminate that. You don't want people inquiring the tool. You want people inquiring the world they live in, according to this theory. Um, and as for the second question about uh, microworlds, I think microworlds, if I understand them right, um, they're a pretty complex concept. Um, I think microworlds shut out the rest of the world sometimes. And I think that's one thing that Mitch brought to microworlds with Scratch, is that Scratch does allow you to have community interaction directly built into this software, does allow you to import pictures and sounds, does allow you to export your things these days onto iPads and things like that. Um, but Microworlds traditionally seems like so cordoned off. And that's not a bad thing, right? That's how you get to powerful ideas. You want to study recursion. You want to study architectural form. Well, then gosh darn it, cut everything out. And we'll build things out of wooden blocks. And we'll, um, we'll study computer programming. Um, the micro world is beautiful for focusing on a powerful idea, unless that powerful idea is intertwining with the, the natural world that you live in, in which case it, it doesn't get it. So. Yeah. Hey. Um, hey. Um, one of the things I really like your kits for is to give you the opportunity to ex viscerally explore the world and build that literacy. But in a lot of the emerging educational trends, like like open courseware and books. Uh -oh. um, that, that's missing. So how do you see, you know, over the next 20 years or so, how do you see some of your concepts uh, being integrated into some of these emerging trends and education? Uh, so like, how would the tools that I make be in, in, in folded into a, a MOOC, for example? Yeah, to some extent, yeah. Because I, I see complementary to, you know, this sort of like a missing piece to some of the emerging tools that are coming online now. Um, well, I mean, ideally, they don't have to be bought, and they can just be pushed out in software. And there's multi-purpose hardware that exists now, so sometimes that's possible. But I think what you're asking is, is really, and that's OK, and it's good, not a question of theory so much as a question of whatever you want to call it, like business or organization project dissemination. How do you get it out to that many people? And you know that can be hard with hardware. With custom hardware, it's really complicated. And, and I've spent the last two years not at MIT because I've been whatever, like figuring out how customer support works or something like that. But um, I don't know if I understood your question enough to answer it. Is that what you're asking? Or? Yeah, so even on, on a conceptual level, just like I can imagine how your kits can be you know, using using defining the kit as as sort of locally available materials. You don't need to ship anything. Um, but, but I think it's it's just a, an interesting way that you know might open the eyes of No, that's a great concept. And so that's that's something I'm excited about. That's where you're writing activity books. And I mean, you read a book like How to Hide Things in Public Spaces. That's a great book. You don't need any tools for that. You just you know, pop off the top of a metal fence post, put something inside of it. He didn't have to send you anything. All you needed was the book, and books don't have to be made of paper anymore. So I do think that activity kits are as important, if not more important, than the, the electronics that I'm introducing here. But this is Media Lab, and I'm not going to get a PhD for introducing that. But I think it's really powerful and important. Okay. Okay. I, think we're, I think we're going to wrap up now. This we need to leave some time for committee discussions. But I want to thank Jay for. Uh, helping us over the last hour and even more so over the last 10 years, help us all think about things in new ways and see, see the world in new ways. We don't have plenty of time as a committee, but everyone is invited, if you'd like, 
in the lifelong kindergarten area on the fourth floor, there's a reception and some snacks set up. So please feel, so feel free to go down there, uh, mingle with each other as we talk as a committee. And as we finish up, we'll come and join people there in the lifelong kindergarten. You don't see me after a while, means I'm in trouble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> That's true. Um, there, there's like gifts underneath half the seats or something. If you didn't get one, you can look around and there might be some. Unclean gifts.